As you may have seen in the email that was sent out, I want to spend a few minutes talking about Israel, talking about things outside the walls of the synagogue. I don't know where I read this, but in following current events, I read a strange story about Jews and our industriousness. There was a, apparently a Taliban who was fleeing and was desperate for water and was walking through the Afghan desert when he saw something far off in the distance. Hoping to find water, he hurried toward the mirage only to find a little Jewish man at a stand. And he was selling ties. And the Taliban said to him, do you have water? And the Jewish man replied, I have no water. Would you like to buy a tie? They're only five dollars. Taliban shouted hysterically, what are you talking about? I don't need this overpriced Western adornment. I need water. Sorry, I, I have ties. They're pure silk, five dollars. Ah, curse you. I don't want your ties. I have to conserve my energy and find water. And the old Jewish man said, it's okay. It does not matter to me that you don't want to buy a tie or that you feel so strongly and threaten my life. I will show you that I am bigger than all of that. If you continue over that hill to the east for about two miles, you will find a restaurant. It has the finest food and all the ice-cold water you can drink. I bid you to go in peace. The man staggers over the hill. A couple hours later, he crawls back almost dead, and he said, they won't let me in without a tie. I can't tell whether Eric thinks it's funny or it's terrible, or a little bit, oh, it is, okay, good. Yeah, 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 all right, all right. <sighs> should a rabbi, should a rabbi speak or not speak about, fill in the questions, fill in the blank, the elections, Israel, race in America? Often I lean towards no. First, because I am not a political pundit, and I don't claim some expertise in reading the newspapers that I have that you do not. And I do think also that there must be places and times in our lives that are saved from the, toxi the toxicity of today's political discourse. But I am, I have this bug in me, because a Judaism that totally cocoons itself from the world is unworthy of our attention. As a matter of principle, the conservative movement takes seriously both fidelity to the tradition we have inherited from our ancestors and the necessity, in fact, the de desirability for the world that we live in to impact and change our practice of Judaism. For example, as American and Western society more fully recognized women's equality in the public sphere, the liturgy of the conservative movement began to reflect that change by including our foremothers, Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, and Leah, in our prayers as a reflection of the significance of women's roles in Judaism. The mention of our foremothers makes visible the presence of women as part of our historical covenant with God. And for conservative Judaism, our participation in the world and the insight that the world gave us in making that change is not a weakness. That's a blessing. Judaism must not only evolve by incorporating moral progress into itself, but must also speak to the world in which we live. Of all the days on the Jewish calendar, Rosh Hashanah is a day when we turn outward, when we celebrate not a Jewish historical event, but the birthday of the world, when we remind ourselves of one of Judaism's most important messages, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai our God is not God of a particular place, nor merely the God of Israel, but Adonai Echad, God is one, creator 
of the whole world. To believe God is creator of the world is to inherit an obligation beyond ourselves, beyond our own tribe, to care for the world that we've been given. And yet, as I said before, I am not a a prophet. I'm not possessed with some special political insight. And so what can we say? What I'd like to do this Rosh Hashanah is to ask, to beg in myself and from others, humility in our public discourse and specifically about Israel. When engaged in conversations about things as weighty and complex as the issues that confront America and Israel and the world, the more that someone tells me that they have all of the answers, the less I trust them. For me, the conversation must begin and continue with a deep sense of, I might be wrong, and I don't know. In the book of Ezekiel, we read, Thus said the Lord God, I am going to deal with you, O Pharaoh, king of Egypt, mighty monster sprawling in its channels, who said, Pharaoh, what did Pharaoh say? He said, my Nile is my own. I made it for myself. Veli Asitani. According to this, Pharaoh's deep character flaw is a belief that he created the Nile, that he created the world that surrounds him, Or as the Midrash points out, you can also read that last phrase, Veli Asitani, as perhaps I made myself. I am responsible for myself and all that surrounds me. Today we affirm God created the world and my friend and teacher Rabbi Shai held the Rosh Yeshiva of Machon Hadar in New York shared with me This idea that the human correlate to the teaching that God created the world is simply, I did not. That no human being possesses all the answers. It is a painful irony that the pages of Israeli newspapers are far more tolerant of deep disagreement than the discourse of our own Jewish community. Good people, and let me be very clear, good people can and should ask pointed questions. Judaism has long trusted the wisdom that comes from machloket, from shakla vitaria, from the back and forth question and answer between two people who hold conflicting ideas in their hands. That when we engaged in those conversations, we should hold in one hand a notion that I am right, and in the other hand a notion of, and tell me why I might be wrong. The Talmud in Baba Metzia shares a story that after Reish Lakish died, Reish Lakish was the dear Chavruta, the dear friend and study partner of Rabbi Yochanan, Rabbi Yochanan grieved for him greatly, and the rabbis asked, what can we do in order to restore his peace of mind? And they said, let's get Rabbi Elazar ben Padat and place him before Rabbi Yochanan. For his traditions already, he's a really good student. Maybe he'll be able to take his place. And they brought him and seated him before Rabbi Yochanan. And for every issue that Rabbi Yochanan mentioned, he said, there is a teaching that supports you. And Rabbi Yochanan said to him and to the teachers who had brought this guy before him, do I need this? When I made a statement, the son of Lakish, my dear Chavruta and friend Reish Lakish, he would object with 24 objections and I would solve them with 24 solutions. And thus the Torah grew. 
but you say there's a teaching that supports you. I don't need to hear that. I know, he said, that my own traditions are accurate. I need you to tell me how they're not. And he tore his clothes and went crying at the gates, where are you, son of Lachish? And could not be consoled. He yearned for someone to challenge, not confirm his own views. He longed for someone to raise questions. And from that process, the Torah grew. Wisdom comes into the world when people are humble and say, tell me how I might be wrong. In our community, my friend, Rabbi Eric Solomon, with whom I led a trip together to Israel earlier in the summer, proposed a trip. It included a visit to Yasser Arafat's grave on the itinerary. I want you to know that there were good people who wrote to him and met with him privately and with the respect befitting a teacher and a leader in our community, and they urged him to reconsider and asked him to explain his thinking. Reasonable people can and did ask questions about what is to be gained by standing before Arafat's grave. That's a reasonable question. In the end, Rabbi Solomon decided to cancel the trip. The important thing that I want to share with you is what he wrote, part of, a little part of what he wrote to his congregation. He said, while my intentions were pure, my heart broke as I listened to the pain my actions had caused some congregants. I listened carefully to the feedback and discussed what I heard with Rabbi Jenny and synagogue leaders, and after deep reflection and soul searching, I've decided to cancel the trip. And to anyone who feels confused, hurt, or upset on account of my actions, I sincerely apologize and ask your forgiveness. He went on to talk about the reasons that he didn't cancel the trip, but he concludes as follows. I deeply love Beth Meyer and what we as a family have built over the past 11 years. And I want to emphasize that my love embraces each and every one of you regardless of where you land on the spiritual, social, or political spectra. I am touched that so many congregants pleaded with me to move forward as plans, but I cannot and will not do anything that jeopardizes the integrity of the Beth Meyer family. I know Rabbi Solomon and his convictions. And I know that canceling the trip was deeply painful. And I want to say here on Rosh Hashanah that I commend him publicly, first, second, and third, for his love of his congregation and his love of the Jewish people and love of Israel. We need more such love to be put front and center Israel used to be something that united the Jewish people. I fear it threatens to tear us apart. None of us has all the answers. In what we do and what we say, I pray we can express ourselves with love for one another and with humility. I want to end by sharing a story that was shared with me by Rabbi Jack Reamer. He tells that when the Baal Shem Tov, the founder of Hasidism, was young, he was bored in class. The study of Talmud with all its fine legal points did not attract him. Sometimes he spent the hours of class staring out the window and he was entranced by one beautiful rose bush that grew just outside the classroom. He was fascinated by the beauty of this rose and felt that this rose embodied all the holiness in the world. Even though 
the ethics of the fathers, Pierre Caevo teaches that one who states, who breaks his learning to stare at nature, risks his spiritual life. Nevertheless, the Baal Shem Tov took a risk. He was entranced by the rose bush and couldn't take his eyes out off of it, and so he was thrown out of school that day. <laughs> and what did he do? He ran off into the forest, and when he got there, he went from one tree to the next, hugging each one and contemplating the wonders of creation that it revealed. And then something wondrous occurred. He felt a hand on his shoulder, so he turned around, and there was a kindly old man standing there, and the Baal Shem Tov had no idea who this man was, even though he lived in a small town and thought he knew everyone who was there. This man he had never seen before. The old man patted the Baal Shem Tov gently on the shoulder and said, can I give you a blessing? Baal Shem Tov said, of course. The old man put his hands over the eyes of the child and said to him, may you always have Hegel Eugen. May you always have holy eyes. And then he disappeared. We don't know who that man was, maybe Elijah, maybe an angel. But we do know that the Baal Shem Tov said that this was the greatest blessing that he ever received. Can we look at each other? Can we look at Israel with holy eyes? I want you to know I was given a gift. I'd been to Israel many, many times since I first went there in 1993, probably more than 15 times in the last 20 years. I'd never taken a group from my synagogue. And it had really been a long time, if ever, that I had been leading a group that was filled with people, most of whom had never been there before. And they were able to see it with holy eyes. The nature, the people, my friend Bobby, who tirelessly works day in and day out, doing security for 19 different communities along the Lebanon border, to swim in the waters of Sahne, to cry as we arrived to Jerusalem. And we didn't paper things over. Rabbi Solomon and I shared a vigorous debate on the way up to Jerusalem about all of the challenges that Israel faces and all the dilemmas that it puts to us. But we could see, I was given the gift of seeing with holy eyes. Not only Soros and not only issues, but people and history and love and richness. I pray that we can see that in each other when we have these conversations. I pray that we can struggle together about how to help Israel to protect herself and to embody Jewish ethical imperatives, to lift up Jew and Palestinian alike. May we see with holy eyes. Bethel is a holy place, not because of this room or the ark or the eternal light, but what makes a synagogue a holy place is that people gather here to pray and to be with each other. This place is holy because it's an assembly of holy people who have come here to reach to God in prayer and to be with each other in community. We can only know that community if we speak and act with humility. 
that none of us has all the answers and that God's image is present in each and every person and in Israel as well. May we be blessed to see with holy eyes. Kini Ratzon, may it be so. Amen.